notice that some analysts are more pessimistic than others. You know, some of them are arguing that even if uh, you know the northern hemisphere, countries in northern hemisphere like uh, North America, Europe, Korea, China, even if we are getting out of the woods, you know, it's not gonna uh, you know resolve the situation totally because there will be other parts of the world and there will be, uh, you know, uh, rebounds everywhere, uh, you know, anytime. And uh, that will, so the, the, this will come back, even if you uh, look like you are out of the trouble. Um, so in that case, uh, you know, some people think that uh, the, the pandemic will not go away uh, until uh, there are uh, vaccines or treatment dr drugs available and all we can do is uh, kind of muddling through waiting for for that and uh, and by doing so uh, in, in some European countries they also think that they can you know a lot of their population can get what is called herd immunity uh, a lot of uh, people get immunity by getting sick which is quite a uh, you know, dangerous assumption. But I, I think th some countries in Europe even try that, but by now they all look like you know, having given up on that. Mm. Um, so, will there be any uh, solution to this? Or you know, basically we are modeling through waiting for vaccines? That's true. Mm -hmm. um, your point about um, no country being safe until the world is safe is is absolutely on the mark. Um, this disease has illustrated um, how the globalization and the global interconnectedness of the world um, has resulted in uh, the fact that if one country um, is having disease, all countries are uh, are at risk. Now, in terms of muddling through, um, uh, I would I would say that you know we we have to muddle through with um, with a certain amount of uh, discipline. Um, uh, no better illustrated than right here in Korea, with its extraordinary success with intensive testing, diagnosis, isolation of cases, um, quarantine of contacts. Together we call this containment, as well as some social uh, distancing. But um, you can imagine, um, I think the total number of cases in Korea to date has been about 10,000. Mm. The case, that basically means that 0.2 people per thousand mm. in Korea have had clinical disease. Now even if maybe two or three times that number had infection, Mm. That's still only about 0.5 per thousand. Um, that will not be close to the level of the population that will need infection-derived immunity to cause herd immunity. Mm. Now, herd immunity basically means that if enough, enough of the population um, uh, is uh, is uh, immune. Um, then um, the transmission overall in the population will go down because much of the transmission is going to people who are immune, who cannot pass the, mm. the, uh, the infection on. Uh, but uh, turning back to Korea, which I think illustrates the point, Korea will have to keep up this diligent, expensive, um, energy and personnel uh, intensive effort, um, you know, until the world is safe mm. or until there's a vaccine. Mm. Because Cor the Korean population is very much at risk, mm. okay? They don't have immunity. Mm. Um, now, um, will drugs be the answer? Uh, drugs are acutely needed, mm. but likely their major effect will be in saving lives, not in reducing transmission. It will reduce some extent. But we know, for example, that transmission of this infection 
begins several days before people develop symptoms. Mm -hmm. So, um, and people are not going to take drugs until they develop symptoms. No. So transmission will mm -hmm. continue. So a vaccine is critically important, but sadly, you know, a vaccine will, will not likely be with us for at least a year. Yeah. Well, hearing what you say, John, uh, I, I fear that, you know, these countries that have a lot of cases, um, you know, they, even though they are suffering, uh, they, uh, they might have more of what is called herd immunity. And when it comes to rebound, uh, you know, they might be in a little better position. Uh, well, the Korean uh, healthcare authorities have been praised for very thorough, uh, you know, testing and isolation policy, uh, which seems to be working because of the number of new cases uh, is going down dramatically in mm -hmm. recent days. But that doesn't, you know, to me, that doesn't seem to give a, a total comforts. Because as you said, you know, even if we go down to zero new cases for, for, for several days, that was the way when it started. We had zero cases for several days and then we got one case and then it uh, proliferated. So, uh, because we don't have that kind of herd immunity in our population, that means that we c it can start a horrible game anytime as long as there are a lot of outbreaks uh, outside Korea. Right. And, and we cannot afford to shut down our countries for too long, you know. We are very dependent on uh, interactions with other countries. We are very dependent on our trade uh, and human exchanges as well. Um, so there will be a time when we have to make a decision on whether or not we should continue this uh, isolation policy, uh, shutdown policy, or we will have to take uh, the, uh, the risk, you know, uh, bite the bullet and open it up uh, even at the uh, risk of a little bit of a rebound. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, now, I mean, of course, this is a, um, an issue with which certainly the United States is mm -hmm. um, actively and in, in full public view struggling with and debating. Uh, of course, the United States is right in the midst um, of a, uh, a, a, a severe coronavirus epidemic, and it becomes a little bit hard to imagine shutting down under these circumstances. Korea is in a very different uh, position. You, you point out that the entire country is reporting 20 or fewer cases per day. It's um, but then the, the question comes, to what extent can, um, can life be further relaxed? Um, and this creates, you know, um, uh, a discussion about the need for testing. Mm. Um, particularly, uh, the need for testing for um, antibodies mm. in the bloodstream that are protective uh, against this virus. Uh, one could imagine a situation in which there's widespread testing um, of people for antibodies uh, and those that have them would go back to work mm -hmm. safely. Okay. But what we are doing is not antibody testing. Be right. well, we don't, we don't even have a reliable antibody test yet. Uh, this is kind of futuristic mm -hmm. um, thinking. Um, the other approach is just hugely intensive testing for the virus. Mm -hmm. Um, um, uh, and isolation, contact tracing um, uh, of, 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 of contacts of cases, um, perhaps um, uh, geographically positioning neighborhoods that appear safe and those people can go to work, others cannot, and so forth. I mean, this is a, an enormously complicated problem. Yep. Okay, John, having discussed, uh, you know, uh, the ongoing uh, public health crisis caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I would appreciate it if you could share with me uh, your, your insights on uh, more lasting impacts of this uh, crisis 
on human life and human society. You know, when we have uh, uh, the, this magnitude of crisis affecting all of the world, I think the UN Secretary General has declared that this is probably the uh, biggest crisis we are facing after the Second World War. Um, so this magnitude of crisis should have a little more lasting impact and um, you know probably bring about changes in our uh, lifestyle, in our uh, society, in, in the way people uh, behave and interact with uh, one another. Uh, so as a, as a world-renowned expert on uh, infectious diseases and vaccines, uh, what, for example, what do you think uh, about possible three most important changes that will happen in the post-coronavirus world? So, of course, anything I say is complete speculation. <laughs> um, but, um, and I'll restrict my crystal ball gazing uh, to um, medicine and public health. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, in, in medicine, um, we are going to see the rise um, of technology, uh, particularly technology that minimizes the direct interactions of doctors and patients. So we're going to see much more telemedicine, much more e-medicine. We're also going to see the rise of, of, of technology uh, that, uh, in some sense, eliminates much of the need for doctors. The use of mm. artificial uh, intelligence to create diagnostic algorithms mm. to make patient uh, diagnoses. Kind of robot doctors. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I think the use of robots mm. is something that will, um, that will happen. We'll see much more uh, of the use of 3D printers yeah. for devising all kinds of biological and non-biological uh, medical uh, devices. Um, and I think um, uh, in public health, uh, in public health we're going to see much more use of artificial intelligence for analyzing big data sets. Mm huge population patient data sets, uh, both um, for um, uh, monitoring disease and predicting where it goes. I, I recently read a paper by Ty Taiwanese doctors about how Taiwan has used these big data strategies mm -hmm. in its fight uh, against, uh, against COVID. Now, in public health per se, um, this, this, this epidemic has been a wake-up call. Mm. Public health has been chronically underfunded. Mm. Um, the US CDC is way underfunded mm. uh, right now. It's easy uh, to underfund. Um, uh, uh, it's not easy to underfund, um, you know, medicine because it's treating ill patients. But a lot of public health is dealing with healthy people, mm -hmm. um, and I think we're realizing we can't we can't do that mm -hmm. uh, anymore. I think in public health as well, uh, what has been especially underfunded has been um, uh, funding whereby um, countries like the United States or Korea or other affluent countries um, assist developing countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, in enhanced detection, mm -hmm. containment, and reporting of emerging infections as soon as they occur. Because after all, most of these bad bugs mm -hmm. are going to emerge mm -hmm. in, uh, in, developing, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, developing countries. Mm -hmm. Where they have poor hygiene. Well, that's right. No, that, 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 um, that's exactly right. And then I, I have one optimistic mm -hmm. prediction. Uh, in recent years, we've, we've seen a very, very um, distressing and discouraging decline 
uh, in public and government reliance on facts and science. Mm. Um, the term false, yeah, false facts has, yeah. has come out. Science has been completely disregarded uh, in many respects. Yeah, including um, fake news. <laughs> yeah, that's fake news. That's yeah, yeah. Um, and um, you know, I, I think the the consequence of that is now being seen. Mm. Um, I you know I'm from the United States. I'm sad to say that the U.S. Uh, government has been sadly uh, following um, this uh, pursuit of politics and ignorance uh, or, or disregarding of uh, scientific facts, and now we've seen the result. Yeah, the intensity of the of this U.S. epidemic did not need mm. to happen. Uh, it was putting politics before science. Um, and uh, equally optimistically, um, my hope is that there may be a dispersion mm. of this trend so that, for example, people realize, well, gee, uh, you know, we didn't, uh, we, uh, we didn't believe the scientists and we, and, we, and we really got bashed by coronavirus. And right now, we're really not believing the scientists on climate change. Mm. And we're going to get equally bashed by that. Mm. And my hope is that this will uh, lead to, uh, to good things in other areas as well.